All right, let's get started. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We're very excited about today's webinar. Um, the title is, Did You Feel That? Construction Vibration Damage Claims. Um, now this is a very hot topic, something that a lot of people have asked for. So we're very excited to share this information. It seems like it's incredibly relevant to a lot of adjusters and lawyers and brokers out there. So thank you very much for joining us. We, uh, we actually have uh, representation from every single province. We have people attending from every single province of Canada, uh, which is really exciting. We also have people from down south, so welcome to all of you. I just wanted to go through a couple of quick points with you first. By now, you would have clicked on the link to sign in and your attendance is being accounted for so that you could receive a completion certificate after the webinar. We're going to be doing a live Q&A at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to submit your questions via the text box under the webinar screen. Um, you could just submit them there and then we will go through them at the end of the webinar. Now, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible within the hour. If we don't get to your question in the webinar, we promise to follow up with you after the fact to make sure your questions are answered. We'll send a, an individual email to make sure that, um, uh, that we get to you and make sure that uh, all of your questions are answered. All questions will be anonymously addressed unless you want a shout out. So you could just write your name and your company if you wish, then your question or comment. And the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website and on LinkedIn and YouTube pages. So please feel free to pass them on to your colleagues or even use them in team meetings if you wish. We'll be sending each of you a completion certificate in a follow-up email. It usually takes a few days for us to get to tally up all the names of the attendees and, and uh, uh, put those completion certificates together. For those of you who are not signed into the webinar under your own name but are attending within a group, please email me at webinar at origin-and-cause.com and I'll have one made up for you. And at the end of the webinar, when you close the GoToWebinar window, the program is going to prompt you to answer five quick questions about the webinar. We really would love to get your feedback. Um, they're questions like, you know, please rank the speakers from one to five, from greatest to to uh, least greatest, or the content as well, and even giving us feedback on what you would like to learn. Um, this topic of this webinar was a result of people's responses to the quick uh, questions submitted in previous webinars. Also, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, you can email our team questions to webinar at origin-and-cause.com. And of course, join in on the conversation on Twitter via hashtag OCWebinar. All right, let's get started. I'd like to introduce our speakers. So first we have Adam Lahanyai. He's a forensic structural engineer with five years, over five years of experience. He specializes in claims related to building envelope failures, structural ass uh, um, assessments. Um, uh, he also works on repair drawings and, and determining what repairs need to be done after so any sort of failure that takes place when it comes to structures and also agricultural structures. We also have Yasser Kurani joining us. He is a forensic structural engineer with over 25 years of industry and academic experience. Prior to joining Origin and Cause, Yasser was an uh, associate professor at the University of Alberta. He has over 500 forensic investigations under his belt, specializing specifically in construction litigation cases. Without further ado, I'm going to pass on the mic to Adam, and he's going to get us started. Thank you, George. So just get us started here with a, a quick pop quiz. Uh, shortly, you will see a uh, polling tool pop up on your screen. But first, uh, just take a look at this photo here and tell me, would you say this looks like vibration damage? And uh, when, the, when the pop up comes up, just click on yes or no, and we'll tally them up, give you a few seconds. Just to give you a bit of background, this is just some cracking that in a finishes over a door. Uh, numbers are coming in. We're looking at about uh, about a 60-40 split. 60% of you said no, 40% of you said yes. And in this case, it is yes. This was vibration damage. Uh, can we get the next slide? Okay. 
All right, so next we've got, again, cracking above a door opening. Would you say this looks like vibration damage? Pop-up should come up. Give you a few seconds here. Okay, so we've got about, about three quarters. Yeah, it's about a 70-30 split. Uh, uh, saying no, 70% saying no, 30% saying yes. And in this case, the answer is no, this was not related to vibrations. Uh, this was uh, something else. Okay, how about this one? We've got some uh, plaster falling off the ceiling. Would you say this looks like vibration damage? Wait for some answers to come in. All right, it uh, looks like about, again, 60-40 split, 60% uh, saying no. Uh, in this case, it was indeed related to vibrations. All right, last one. Uh, we've got some vertical cracking and some exterior brickwork. Would you say this looks like vibration damage? Give a few more seconds for the answers to come in. And it looks like pretty close to 50-50 split. Just barely 55% uh, 50, uh, saying uh, no. Uh, in this case, it was no. This is not vibration damage. So the takeaway point, I hope, is that vibration damage doesn't have a unique um, signature. You can't look at it and, and say, yeah, this is definitely vibration damage or this is definitely not uh, uh, vibration damage simply by looking at it. Uh, it often will look very similar to the type of damage you would expect to see in an old building. Uh, damage from uh, shrinkage, thermal expansion, settlement, uh, what, what have you. So for this reason, uh, you need some expert analysis uh, in, in more than going beyond the visual examination. So next we'll get into the science of vibration damage claims. And we're just going to give you an overview of how we get from vibration to damage. So we start with vibrations being generated at some source, where, whether it's road construction work or heavy traffic going by, could be rail traffic, uh, could be pile driving, whatever it is, uh, those vibrations will travel through the air and the ground and dissipate with distance. So uh, it's very noisy when you're close by, you can feel the ground shake. As you get further away, uh, those effects are diminished. When you're a building close to the source, uh, the building will also receive those vibrations and will react in different ways. So one reaction the building might have is that it will start to sway back and forth. And this is a, it's kind of exaggerated, but th this is the kind of motion that we're, we're talking about here. So the ground moves and then the building moves as well. Uh, this type of motion is more uh, from an earthquake type of uh, ground vibration rather than something like road construction. But nonetheless, this type of uh, motion can occur and uh, would be a direct, um, a direct type of uh, effect that vibration has on buildings. So the other direct effect it can have is uh, the walls or the floors can start vibrating sort of like a drum skin. So the floor starts moving up and down or the walls start moving in and out of plane. And that's uh, the common scenario for uh, construction activities uh, causing vibrations. Uh, th this is what typically will happen to the nearby houses. And we can also get an indirect effect and it can be quite damaging um, where the vibrations actually cause the soil to consolidate. So if we have a, um, a, a loose granular type of soil, we're talking about sand uh, that's not densely compacted, um, then we've got a lot of voids between the particles 
sort of like what you see on the left. And then the vibration energy will start to shake these particles around and they start to fall into more compact configuration. And so the ground level uh, at the surface will drop uh, and anything that's sitting on it will also drop. So the, the house will experience vibration induced settlement and uh, associated damage. So when we're talking about uh, vibration damage, there is a, a huge range it, starting from at the lowest intensity at the bottom of the scale here, uh, where it's just a nuisance, there's no real damage. Uh, gradually increasing, we get cosmetic damage to uh, old and brittle materials like your plaster finishes, uh, progressing into the drywall, uh, stucco, older masonry. Uh, at at uh, really intense and in, in vibrations, we start getting damage into unreinforced concrete and engineered structures. And the types of cosmetic damage you can you can get range from things like drywall pops or plaster becoming damaged. Um, the, the plaster relies on uh, what keying action, um, and over time the, those keys degrade, but uh, vibration uh, will will help uh, break them as well. And here we see uh, structural damage to. Uh, to masonry, it's uh, this is an interesting little experiment. This uh, masonry shed here, um, it was slated to be demolished. It's old, uh, not really well maintained. But the uh, company doing the road work outside um, decided, since it's going to be demolished anyway, that they would uh, run a little experiment. So they ran this uh, roller here at the maximum vibration settings, uh, very close to the building. Not something you would see in a typical uh, construction project. But at the beginning of the test, uh, is we've got the photo on the left. And then on the right, uh, two minutes later, you can see the damage that this caused. So several of the bricks have fallen away. Um, so like I said, the, it wasn't in great uh, condition to begin with, but it does illustrate that at very intense vibrations, uh, you do cause damage even to structural materials. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand this off to uh, my colleague Yasser Karani. Thanks, Adam. Now that we have uh, an introduction to the link between vibration and damage, it is appropriate that we go over the factors that affect the extent of vibration damage. Well, one obvious factor would be the intensity of the source, how intense the vibration. Uh, another important factor would be how close or far the structure from the source. And the third most important factor would be the duration for the exposure. Is the project, the construction project going on for a month or for a year or two? Is my building exposed to vibration for a week, a month or for a year or two? So these are the three most important factors, the intensity, the duration of exposure, and how close the structure is to the source of vibration. And we are going to elaborate on each of these factors uh, as we uh, move along in our talk. Uh, another important factor here is what type of structure you have. Is it steel framed industrial engineered industrial building, like the one shown here on the screen, or it's a simple residential building with wood framed construction and a brick veneer. We would expect that buildings constructed with lighter, softer materials, such as wood framed houses, such as older masonry buildings, would sustain higher level, higher level of damage over what we refer to as engineered structures. That would be reinforced concrete structures and steel framed structures. And that would be for the same level of intensity. So if there is a project going on and you have a bunch of structures along with this project, some happen to be residential, others happen to be commercial of steel, steel framing, you would expect to see more damage to the residential ones over the engineered ones.
Another factor that impacts the extent of the damage, as we explained earlier, the energy of vibration travels through air or ground. Most of it would travel through the ground. So the type of soil here plays a great role in determining how much energy is received by the structure. If you happen to have a granule type of soil under intense vibration, this, this type of soil could consolidate. What that mean, consolidate? It means that it's going to vibrate to the point where you will eliminate some of the voids. The particles start to interlock more and eliminate some of the voids, some of the air. If you do that, what's going to happen to the ground? Well, it will drop slightly. Anything that's constructed above would be impacted and you'll end up with some settlement. It would look, at the first look, when you go and, and examine it, as any type of soil settlement that you might get. But in this particular case, it will be a direct result from vibration. So type of soil here is very important. If you happen to have a structure on clay soil, that will be different from granule type of soil. We talked about the receiving structure. So now we're going to talk about what causes vibration, how vibration could result in our uh, uh, neighborhoods and areas that we live in. From our experience working on so many vibration files, we identified the main sources of vibration uh, as follows. You'd have some traffic related vibration. Uh, for example, you could have a close by uh, rail line, LRT. You could happen to have to be living right close to a main road that's frequented by heavy trucks, 18 wheeler trucks, and that would fall under long term exposure. Uh, under those circumstances, uh, it is reasonable to see some vibration damage to older buildings, to wood frame uh, residential houses. Another common practice uh, here is to resurface roads. You know that in, in our uh, harsh weather, the asphalt layer in our roads uh, uh, gets deteriorated quickly, and we need pretty much every summer to do some repair work. So we use jackhammering to get rid of the impacted sections of the asphalt layer, sometimes to remove part of the walk, concrete walkways to make room for the new one. And if you happen to live nearby an area where this type of project was going on, uh, you could attest to the intensity of vibrations that would come out of jackhammering. De again, depending on how close you are to the project or how far your building is to the project. Uh, we are in our area here in the Greater Toronto area, as everybody knows around the country, we have uh, construction booming and we're building new uh, neighborhoods uh, every day. Uh, with new construction comes the need for new roads. So bulldozing uh, the, the ground around new construction uh, is not uncommon and you would, you would go through this new development in phases. So phase one, you are the lucky person who owns a house in phase one, and they are still continuing their construction in phase two of the de development, and they're still working on paving, bulldozing the, the way around uh, to make roads. And sure enough, this type of heavy equipment would generate, could generate uh, intense enough vibrations to cause uh, some damage to residential construction. Uh, another piece of equipment that's used uh, in road construction, uh, it, it's used for pavement milling. It, it is the equipment that you see here on the screen. Uh, it, it, it simply grinds and chews the uh, old layer of asphalt. So it is loaded from the rear of the equipment into, you could load it into trucks, remove it to make room for new layer of asphalt. This acting of, of grinding and chewing away the existing pavement creates a great deal of vibration. Uh, obviously, resurfacing roads uh, happens in, in neighborhoods where it has been developed already, well established, there are buildings around, there is no avoidance to that, and that will create 
a vibration that could possibly cause damage. And one of the uh, main suspects in uh, construction vibration is the uh, vibratory compaction that's again used in road construction. And uh, for those who have seen roads built, you know that before you put this black asphalt layer, you have a substrate under that supports it. And this vibrator, vibratory compaction machine is used to compact this layer to make it as, as, as sound as possible to support the asphalt layer and the traffic above. So because the, the use of this heavy equipment in road construction, uh, it ge does generate vibration. And typically for those type of projects, because typically there are larger scale projects, that's recognized beforehand. And the contractors typically ask it to engage the services of uh, professional engineers to do a vibration damage assessment. One of the sources also for vibration damage is driving biles. Uh, driving biles simply means when you have uh, steel members like the one shown, shown on the screen or uh, a precast concrete biles, you use a sort of a very huge uh, hammer if you will it's it's a very huge machine that drops a heavy weight on top of this column like member to drive it into the ground to the depth required why on earth would need to do that well we need to do that for so many reasons uh, when we build the bridges the uh, bridge abutment the support for the bridge would typically be supported on biles so when you have a steep grade and you are building a facility and you need to create your fence around this facility you need to have a retaining wall so the soil doesn't wash over into the facility so those piles would provide support for your retaining walls and lastly uh, we we have seen a vibration damage due to unfortunate uh, incidents such as gas explosions uh, though they are very infrequent but unfortunately we have seen in our area uh, in the last two or three years, at least two major events where one house uh, experienced uh, some significant gas explosion and we received uh, numerous requests to assist damage to surrounding properties that have been impacted not directly by the explosion itself, but by the vibration energy that resulted from this explosion. Plasting for so many projects, is another source to generate vibration. Um, usually that relates to mining and uh, in some cases just to prepare for uh, new highways. Uh, usually it's not in highly populated areas. I'll, I'll go back, I believe, to this quantity, the peak particle velocity and how it is possible for us to measure it. And we have uh, a simple, relatively simple equipment that we could use to measure the big particle velocity. These are the accelerometers, geophones, and so-called vibration meters. Uh, someone would say, well, accelerometers, we use these to, to measure earthquake intensity. And that's correct. It is the same principle. There are similarities between the earthquake phenomena and the vibration excitation resulting from uh, construction. So what to do with this number once we were able to determine this number? We take this number and check it against the uh, st existing standards or guidelines for the threshold to cause vibration damage. Uh, the consensus among all the available standards and guidelines that occupants would start to feel vibrations at PPV value of 0.5 millimeter per second. It takes only 0.5 millimeter per second, big particle velocity, for us occupants to feel vibration and start to be alarmed. But if we look at this table, 
which is out of the United States Federal Transportation Agency uh, guideline, you will see that you need over 12 millimeter per second to start to cause any damage to reinforcing concrete or steel structures. If we move down this table to the type of buildings, residential and uh, uh, small strip mall type of uh, structures, which is wood frame type of structures, uh, this number goes down from over 12 to slightly above five. Five millimeter per second, you start, that's the threshold required to cause any damage to those type of structures. Uh, never mind number three at the very bottom that you see on this table, that's a designated to very old, 100, 100 years old historic type of uh, structures that's very vulnerable to vibration. Uh, presently in Canada, we don't have a standard Canadian standard to consult with regards to vibration. The city of Toronto has its own uh, uh, guideline, uh, but we typically consult the British standards, the German standards, the Swiss standards, and uh, the, there is uh, more or less some consensus on the threshold values that would cause damage to a uh, certain type of structure. Well, then, uh, the, the point I guess I'm trying to uh, demonstrate here is the fact that people are more sensitive to vibrations than buildings. It's not because you're sitting at home and you feel the vibration or your glasses rattled in the kitchen that would automatically mean that your structure sustained damage due to vibration. It takes, as in the case of residential buildings, 10 times energy than what we feel in order to start to cause damage. I will hand it over now to my colleague, Adam, to uh, describe to you what goes into the investigative process of vibration damage. Thank you, Yasser. Uh, so to give you a quick overview of uh, what it is we, we do in a vibration damage claim. So we want to review available information, like uh, things like the construction project details, what was the scope of the project, the schedule, the equipment they were using, uh, what activities were being completed and when. So things like the activity logs will be very helpful there. Uh, what are the local soil conditions um, like? So if there's any geotechnical reports available. Um, on large scale projects, there might be a pre-construction property survey. So the contractors as part of their due diligence might have gone and surveyed uh, nearby homes and, and documented uh, what sort of damage was present before the construction even began. And that way they've got something in their back pocket in case, in case any homeowner makes a claim. Uh, also on large scale projects, there might be a pre-construction uh, vibration assessment study. Uh, so uh, if that's available, uh, we you know, we want to see the results of that study, what what risks were identified, uh, what recommendations were made to mitigate any risks, um, what site-specific uh, vibration data is available, whether that's from the pre-construction pre study or if there's any, even possibly any vibration monitoring uh, done during the construction. All that information, uh, great to have. It, it just improves uh, the precision and accuracy of our of our own analysis. So next we would uh, uh, also um, examine the site, take a look at the damage, uh, severity of damage, locations of damage, uh, the general pattern of the damage, um, any, any sort of signs uh, that could also help explain uh, what we're seeing, uh, any pre-existing conditions or, or other causes that could have been um, you know, the, the more likely explanation for this damage. Uh, we would interview occupants, uh, determine, you know, get a feel for what their experience was. They, you know, they felt vibrations. Well, how, um, what's their own description of that, of that feeling? Uh, did they hear, you know, did they hear the dishes rattling? Uh, what equipment was working at the time? Often the homeowner, when, when they are alarmed and disturbed by the vibrations, they go and they go and take a look at, uh, what's going on outside. Uh, so they might know uh, what equipment was being used. They might have specific days written down uh, that were worse than others. 
if we have that information, we can compare that to the uh, foreman's logs and the equipment list. Uh, they may have before and after photos. Um, so we can see the progression of damage. Uh, and so we take, we take all this information and then we carry out our own vibration analysis and we try to establish uh, the, the likely zone of influence for the different uh, construction activities in, in the area. And, and the idea there is to um, just have another tool to, to help us determine it, whether it's plausible or not that vibrations exceeded our damage threshold. So I, I mentioned the zone of influence. So that's um, an area around a source where the threshold vibration, whichever that threshold um, that we've set, uh, within that zone, uh, the vibrations would be expected to be higher than this threshold. So uh, I've got two circles here on, on the screen. So the smaller red circle, uh, we're talking about, for example, uh, dump trucks traveling up and down the street. They're moving some uh, earth uh, material that's uh, being um, removed from a, another project. Uh, so they're going up and down the street and people are saying the, the trucks are causing vibrations. Well, the red zone here, that might be our damage threshold. And the yellow zone, well, that might be our uh, disturbance threshold. So the yellow zone, it reaches the houses, but the red zone, it barely even um, leaves the roadway. So in this case, we, we've uh, estimated our zone of influence. Uh, we can confirm that, yeah, um, it's plausible that some homeowners would feel vibrations at their homes. The, it, they are within the zone of influence for disturbance, but the zone of influence for damage is is really basically limited to the roadway, so we wouldn't expect to see any actual damage to the to the houses. So have an uh, an example to go through here. Uh, it's we've got a situation where a homeowner um, has. Um, reported uh, strong vibrations and cracking in their in the finishes in their house. There's a, a new service road that's been constructed about 50 feet away. Uh, the construction went on all summer. Uh, the local soil is a hard clay. And uh, you might recognize the picture from the pop quiz. <laughs> so so we come up with a range. Uh, we determined that the, the Strongest source of vibration here was the vibratory roller. Uh, based on the information that we had available to us, we um, estimated that the range of likely particle peak particle velocity experienced at the house was somewhere between seven and 10 millimeters per second. So here we've got a zone of influence based on, um, it's, it's the damage threshold, the zone of influence, but using two different estimates uh, because um, of variance in, our, in, the, in the data. So here, even our low estimate reaches the house and the high estimate just covers a larger area. So here we would, we would have this analysis and the results of this analysis would say to us that it's plausible that the vibration intensity was above that threshold for damage. And so it's plausible that some of this damage that we're seeing is indeed caused by vibrations. So to recap, what info information are we looking for to do our investigation? So things we'd like to have uh, generally would all be available from the contractor who's doing the work. Um, so things like the equipment list, what equipment was being used for this for the work. Uh, the civil engineering project drawings, where's, what's the scope of the project, what was being done, where is it being done, uh, activity logs so that we know what activity was working and when, um, local soil conditions, so geotechnical reports uh, in lieu of that um, uh, might have to uh, do a little bit of site investigation or uh, refer to um, older geotechnical reports if they happen to be available for other projects but in a similar area. Um, Pre-construction survey, you know, did the contractor go and take notes and photos of, of pre-existing conditions 
uh, so that we have that information. Um, the pre-construction vibration study on large scale projects, like I said, sometimes they do a, uh, a pre-construction study to identify uh, what properties are at highest risk uh, and provide recommendations on how to mitigate those risks. And there may be even um, on, on site specific vibration data yeah, that might they might have even monitored during construction. So all of that uh, information, if it's available, we want it. The contractor would would be able to provide it. So if if you're the adjuster on the on the contractor side, um, that that's the information you want to be given to to your con, um, consultant. Uh, if you are on the homeowner side, this is this type of stuff you want to be asking for, for uh, right away. So with that, uh, we're going to move into the Q&A, and I'll hand it back over to George. Thanks, Adam. All right, so let's look at the questions. Just got uh, a few emails from a few people saying that uh, you were unable to, uh, to hear us. We apologize for that. Um, I believe I unintentionally hit the mute button, so... Please forgive me for that, but uh, it seems like Yasser went back and and covered the majority of the, uh, the the content that was missed. Let me just open up the questions here and let's see. So the first question that I have here is, is it possible for damage to occur below five millimeters per second PPV? I'll pass this on to Yasser to get a to to give us the answer. Thanks, George. Uh, as we discussed in, in, uh, in our talk, uh, there are main factors that would determine the extent of damage, uh, one of which is the intensity. So this five millimeter per second would be a, a quantification for the intensity. But there are also factors such as the uh, distance between the source uh, of vibration and the structure and the duration for exposure. So uh, the short answer to this question would be, yes, it is possible if the type of structure is uh, perhaps non-engineered. One, uh, it is in, in close proximity to the source or closer proximity. And uh, if the exposure is long-term exposure, All right, next question we have here is what kind of damage would you expect to see at five millimeters per second PPV? So let's uh, let's have Adam talk to that. So these uh, thresholds, they are intended to be conservative um, on the conservative side because they are intended to be used really by the people doing the work. Um, and so they don't want this to be sort of an average case. Uh, otherwise, 50% of people would be calling in making claims against them. So these thresholds are, are intended to be conservative. So most of the time, uh, you wouldn't actually expect to see much damage. But in some cases, you would. It does happen, of course. Um, and, and so this is guideline is it's um, it's not to be interpreted as a uh, a strict, well, at 4.9, there's no damage. At 5.1, everything's falling apart. Um, so when you reach that threshold, the most common types of damage you would see would be in the cosmetic range. And as you move up uh, in, uh, uh, in PPV, uh, you would see more damage uh, and start to see damage into other areas beyond the cosmetic damage. Um, but in cases where there is damage at five millimeter per second, uh, it's uh, most likely going to be strictly cosmetic damage. Thanks, Adam. All right, another question here. Um, what are the effects on frozen ground on vibration damages, such as construction during winter versus summer? So I guess the question is, if the ground is frozen, does it have any different impacts rather than doing construction uh, activity in the summer? Let's pass that on 
to Yasser. Well, first, I would love to know this contractor who would be able to do construction during winter underground frozen. That would be one, one hell of uh, contractor. Uh, and because we don't do much construction during winter, there isn't much information uh, uh, available on that. Uh, but in general, we talked about the soil uh, as, as a factor in transmitting the energy to the structure. And uh, with frozen soil, uh, what we think that the uh, attenuation of vibration would be higher. And also, uh, it would depend on the natural frequency of the structure. So it's a combination of things, but it would, frozen soil would uh, really transmit um, more energy uh, to a structure. I think that's a great question, especially because I'm sure there's a lot of emergency repairs taking place, right? So, you know, there's been many instances in um, in larger cities where there's heavily used highways or highway bridges um, that are falling apart. I know in Toronto, we've got a very famous uh, highway that, that, that's that been falling apart for several years. So, you know, that is very relevant. That's a, that's a great question. And it makes sense. You know what, if the, if the, um, if the, the ground is frozen or if the soil is frozen, it's probably absorbing less vibration, right? Would, would, does that make sense? It does. Okay, cool. Great. All right. Next question. When it comes to building collapses due to structural structures weakened due to fire, can that vibration be estimated to an accurate degree? And if so, how? I'll, uh, let's go with Adam. Uh, so if I understand the question, it, it's, it sounds like there's a, the scenario here is that um, there's a building that's severely damaged by a fire, uh, it collapses, and it causes a sort of impulse vibration to surrounding structures. So uh, we did talk about the duration of exposure uh, being a, a factor. And so this sort of vibration would be a very short impulse right it would be one it'd be like a hammer strike uh it that's it um so we're looking at comparing this to a different set of th uh threshold criteria more similar to the threshold you would consider for blasting rather than what you would consider for long-term exposure like a construction project and those thresholds are uh quite a bit higher so um it, the the difficulty in trying to estimate what the actual vibration uh, energy would be would be to try and estimate, I guess, the the weight of the structure that and the amount of energy it imparts to the ground as it strikes the ground. Uh, but then on the on the flip side, um, the amount of uh, uh, or I guess the threshold for damage to surrounding buildings would also be significantly higher because that exposure is so low. Interesting. So say, for example, a, a residence were to collapse due to fire, for example, it's, it's so badly burnt, it collapses, and then there's a shed beside it. Wouldn't the, the, the shed's construction be a variable here, right? Could, would, would that not be a variable as to whether it could be damaged due to a short exposure to vibration? As opposed to like a commercial building beside it, right? I believe that's what Yasser had mentioned in the beginning. It really depends on uh, not only the the sending of of frequency, but the receiver and what what that is. Does that make sense? In a way, yes. Uh, it, it's it's just a bizarre scenario to think about because I think a shed that's adjacent to and attached to a house that collapses, I think you're you're worrying about other types of damage rather than the vibration. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Okay, cool. All right, next. Is it possible to determine whether faulty workmanship contributes to resulting damages from vibration, um, improper fill used, or insufficient compacting? Oh, that's a cool question. All right, yes, sir. Well, t t typically any uh, vibration damage analysis is, is a Com complicated process and uh, 
we, we work with uh, the elimination process. Uh, construction flaws are always a factor in any investigation. Uh, if I understood the question correctly, uh, when you talk about compaction, you're talking about compaction of soil under yeah, un under under foundation, and um, it it uh, it is extremely difficult to to determine after the fact whether the soil was originally well compacted or properly compacted prior to the incident or not. So it is one of those situations where uh, it is extremely difficult uh, unless you have a side that's not impacted by vibration that you could excavate and look at and see that that the, uh, judge the the workmanship. How about improper fill being used? That's that's what was submitted here. Well, in, in the case of the material, th that that's relatively easier because you could do. Uh, uh, a, a little bit of, of uh, excavating to determine the type of material that was used as as a fill, and if the material uh, doesn't meet the requirements, is not the proper type of material, uh, it would consider to be certainly a contributing factor. Great, thank you. That that was a great question. Can you ca comment on the effect of adjacent building demolition or construction, building construction as opposed to road construction? Okay. Um, Adam? Uh, so any use of heavy equipment adjacent to a building has the potential to uh, induce some vibration in, in that building, in the adjacent building. So it is possibly an issue um, although in in that sort of scenario the equipment is not generating a, as nearly as high intensity of vibration as your typical road construction um, so there are other factors involved um, where often when they demolish and, and build a new construction adjacent to a building where they're excavating and uh, there's other effects on the foundation so that would be come into play as well. Um, so it's possible that vibration um, uh, plays a contributing role, but there are many factors uh, that would have to be considered as well. Great, thank you. All right, next question. Would daily use of vibration exercise machines cause damages to the house wow oh. okay <laughs> that's a very interesting uh question i uh i have to say that I, I i haven't received any uh vibration damage claim related to the use of an exercise machine in a house but uh it's a source of vibration uh it's most likely uh low intensity very low intensity vibration uh, usually people place their exercise machine in the basement uh, directly on top of a concrete slab. Um, in, in this scenario, it is uh, highly unlikely that the level of vibration from an exercise machine would cause any damage, even uh, with uh, long term. If the machine is being placed on the second level uh, on top of a, a, a wood frame floor, uh, then you would have, uh, with the longer term exposure, I think a still remote chance to cause some cosmetic damage, uh, such as a drywall bobbing in the ceiling below, uh, some hair cracks in, in the drywalls. Uh, but that would be still, in my uh, judgment, a remote chance. That's a good question. I guess it depends how passionately they're working out, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Can insurable repairs be conducted while vibrations 
are still ongoing. For example, can we conduct vibration damage repairs caused by neighboring construction while construction is still ongoing next door? I'll pass that to Adam. So uh, that's probably not advisable um, because uh, if, if the exposure to vibration is continuing, um, you would like to have some assurance that uh, when you do the repair work, that um, it's going to actually repair all the damage. So um, uh, in the sense, if you want to start by, say, removing the damage finishes that need to be repaired anyway um uh i suppose you could you could start on that before the construction vibration activities cease uh but uh you ought to wait until the uh until the source of vibration or the exposure to vibration has ended uh and the other consideration here is if we're talking about indirect damage where the damage is caused by vibration induced settlement uh then the settlement might not have occurred yet uh the, like the full settlement um so uh, if, this, if this is a scenario where it's indirect damage, there's been soil consolidation, vibration induced settlement, uh, you want to have some assurance that uh, that's not going to continue. Uh, so again, you should wait until after the construction activities are done and assess the full extent of the vibration damage. All right, next question. Is it typical by large construction firms that they would carry out a vibration survey prior to starting projects, i.e. Elliston or PCL, uh, the PCLs of the world? Is this a reasonable expectation? Uh, yes, indeed. For, for large projects, it is sometimes a requirement of the contract by the owner, the municipalities, the cities, that would require the contractor to uh, carry out uh, the survey uh, prior to construction because the liability at the end uh, lies with the owner, so they are on the hook for any compensation for uh, uh, damage due to vibration. And if not... Uh, uh, a requirement, um, uh, many prudent uh, uh, large contractors, particularly when it comes to uh, significant projects with hundreds of millions of dollars, would engage the service of uh, professionals to conduct uh, uh, property survey and conduct pre-construction uh, vibration analysis to aid them to control and, and, and mitigate the impact of the project on the surrounding uh, properties. We've hit our time limit, uh, but just due to the fact that uh, we had some technical issues uh, for about five minutes or so, um, if you guys don't mind, we'd like to continue for to just extend for another five minutes for anyone that has to drop off. We apologize for any issues. We apologize for exceeding our time limit. We've got a ton of great questions that are still rolling in. Uh, if you have to drop off, thank you very much for joining us. Once you close that window, if, if we can trouble you to, um, to, uh, answer the questions, that we have there, we'd really appreciate it. One thing I wanted to mention before you head out is that we have an upcoming webinar that we're very excited about. Um, let me just pull up the slide here. And it it is a live webinar. I'm not sure if you've been part of one of our In the Lab specials. So In the Lab with Origin and Cause Accelerant Detection Dogs. Um, so dogs are able to detect extremely low volumes of fire accelerants with far more accuracy and speed than humans or even machines. They're trained from a very young age to sniff out and lead fire investigators to traces of unburned fuel so that samples can be taken from precise locations and sent to a lab for analysis. Now, this is a fantastic tool that we have in-house in our to conduct investigation, a lot of investigations. Um, and actually the dog that you could see there on, on this slide is smoke. And so smoke is going to be joining us and Sid, his, his, uh, his handler as well in that photo, um, will be in this webinar. You're going to see footage of both of them and how, um, 
when we're going to talk about when and why dogs are used in in uh, fire investigations, the advantages of using accelerant detection dogs, how dogs are chosen and trained, which is a really fun part of of the webinar. Um, I wonder if we're going to have any like uh, little puppies. That would be really cute. And uh, lastly, we're going to show some live examples of how dogs are trained and walk through some of ca some case studies to show you how beneficial these uh, these dogs have been for us and for our clients in the past. Now, it's a live broadcasted webinar. It'll be taking place July 25th at the same time of day as, as this webinar. If you'd like us to sign you up, please indicate that in the questionnaire that pops up on your screen when you're closing the webinar window. It's going to ask you, would you like us to sign you up to the next webinar? And you could say yes or no. We'd love to have all of you guys there. We want to secure a spot for you as spots are limited. So that's that. I want to jump back into the questions. Um, and okay, so the next question here is, how do you determine acceptable limits for vibrations? Does construction type of buildings in the area get factored in? For example, piling work done near residential areas with old homes uh, going back as early as the 1900s. I'll give that to, to Adam. Uh, so when we're talking about uh, old homes, possibly heritage structures, uh, there may be need to um, uh, to go to that even lower uh, damage threshold of three millimeter per second. Uh, but usually five millimeter per second is the threshold even for hundred year old houses um, that that we use um, in in analysis. Uh, the and there's qu there's quite a bit of judgment involved uh, because, like I said before, the, these are not uh, fast and uh, hard numbers that we can uh, say, okay, no damage occurs uh, below this number, and and uh, all the damage occurs above this number. Um, it it's uh, it's a threshold that's supposed to give you a reasonable level of confidence that uh, that most of the time uh, you're okay. Great. Next, I got this question. What is the likelihood of a home built with structured engineered panels B of having damage with pile driving and light rail transit being built three city blocks away? So we've got pile driving and uh, light rail transit about three blocks away. And we've got a home built with structured engineered panels. And it seems like there may be damaging. What is what is the likelihood of that damage to take place? As we uh, explained throughout uh, this talk, uh, we would need to conduct a complete uh, vibration damage analysis. So we would look at the type of equipment used in both projects. We would estimate the distance between the two sources of uh, vibration and the structure. We would consult the available standards uh, and we will have to take a look at the type of damage there. Uh, all these factors combined would enable us to determine for this particular uh, property that's at a certain X distance from these ongoing projects, would it be possible had the a, a vibration um, intensity uh, exceeded the threshold required to cause damage or not. And that's a win we would be able to say, yes, it is possible or no, it is not possible for this damage to have taken place due to vibration. All right. This will be the last uh, question online and then we'll be answering all of the other submitted questions uh, via email after the webinar. I'll make sure that uh, Yasser or Adam do reply to any of your inquiries. And if you think of something after the fact, you can still submit them by uh, uh, emailing us at webinar at origin-and-cause.com. So the last question is, other than polystyrofoam, can concrete be used to fill the gaps caused by vibration damage? If so, will the size of the voids or gaps affect the use of concrete? Um, so I'm not uh, 
quite sure I understand uh, uh, the question here, uh, but um, so your polyfoam uh, is not a structural material. It really shouldn't be used for any sort of repair. Uh, so we'll start getting that out of the way. Um, and then next, if we're talking about damage to a concrete material, then um, it is it's um, so if we're talking about damage to a concrete material, then uh, it depends on the type of damage. It could be could be concrete to do the repair. It might be uh, if we're talking about smaller cracks, uh, might be like an epoxy fill. Um, So uh, I'll hand that back uh, to George uh, for closing. <laughs> so, so I, I want to understand this question. So it says, can concrete be used to fill the gaps caused by, by vibration damage? Let's answer that first. So can concrete be used to fill gaps? Yeah, well, in I, I just... Uh would like to, to add to what uh, Adam said. The uh, as far as we understand the question is that vibration caused some void under concrete slab, for example. And the question here is uh, apart from the uh, polystyrene material that's typically used to lift up settled uh, concrete floors, could concrete be used to fill the gaps? Um, if if that's the question and does not involve any structural repairs to the slab, uh, the answer is you could, but there is a good reason that this polymaterial is used because it is easily injectable under the existing slab. So I'm, I'm, I fail to see an easy way to get this concrete to bump it under the slab to lift it up. But if you are able to, uh, th there is no reason that that couldn't be a viable option. Yeah, so it seems like the follow-up question to that is, if so, if you can use concrete to fill in the gaps, will the size of the voids or the gaps affect the use of concrete? And it seems like, Yasser, you've replied to that. You've simply said um, that sometimes maybe it would be difficult to get concrete to, to creep through entirely, and that's probably why they use uh, the, poly, uh, the poly, uh, styrofoam because it, it creeps through everything and makes sure that, that there are no gaps under there. Yes. Great. That was a good question. Sorry. It was just took us a little bit of time to, to, to understand it, but it, it was definitely a, a great question. So we just wanted to, uh, thank you all, all for joining us for anyone that would like to know a little more about origin and cause you could stay on. I'm just going to run through a couple of slides as to what kind of services we offer. Um, we have a lot of regular clients here so i'm sure you guys don't necessarily need to know all of that but uh you, you're um we thank you all for joining us so i wanted to just go through very quickly who is origin and cause so um So we were established, our business was established 27 years ago. Actually, next month is our is, is our 27th birthday. We're the largest forensic engineering and fire investigation firm in Canada with 15 locations and over 40 experts. Our offices are in Ancaster, uh, Mississauga, Kingston, Ottawa, Sudbury, London, Windsor. Those are all in Ontario. Then we have an office in Halifax and in Sydney, uh, uh, Nova Scotia. We have an office in uh, Winnipeg, which is is Manitoba, Yorkton in Saskatoon and Saskatchewan, Calgary and Edmonton in uh, in, in uh, Alberta, and our Victoria office that recently opened about uh, eight weeks ago, and we're very excited for our upcoming office opening up in Vancouver. That's opening very soon, so stand by for uh, an announcement on that. So our geographical spread has proven to be a great strategic advantage for us. Our clients love the fact that we're able to get on site very quickly and control spoliation of evidence and to complete our investigations very quickly. Um, this is something that has been a priority of origin and cause is, is we want to make sure that whenever you guys give us a call that we try to have someone local, um, someone that is 
that works for us. We don't outsource anything. We just try to get as many boots on the ground as spread out as, as wide as possible that are highly trained experts to make sure that they get on site quickly and make sure they take control of the evidence. Um, and we're for, for, um, when it comes to being part of preferred vendor lists and so on, a lot of independent adjusters ask us like, what kind of vendors or are you part of certain vendor lists? And we'll tell you that we're part of pretty much every single vendor list for insurers all, of all the large insurers in the Canadian market. Um, and for any, uh, company that doesn't have a preferred vendor list, we're amongst the leading firms that are retained for forensic engineering services for those companies. So our investigative process is, is very simple. We, we try to make sure to get you a response as soon as possible. So, you know, we get a new assignment or a new claim uh, uh, sent to us, whether it be from our website or even emailed or called directly to one of our experts. We get on site immediately. We try to get there as quickly as possible. That could be within uh, within a half hour of time. I just saw one of our guys get a new one and just ran out the door. Um, you know, we try to get there. If it's an hour away, we try to be there an hour, in an hour and a half. We try to provide you with a verbal, uh, like a quick phone call to the adjuster while we're on site to give you an update. If you're not available, we'll send you a quick email. And we provide a preliminary report within 24 hours. And it would be followed up with a more formal report if that's what is required of the file or if that's what you need. A lot of adjusters are asking us these days, can I just get a verbal? I want to minimize the expense on this and we do in fact do that in 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 a lot of circumstances where um it is clear that there is no subrogation potential there's no liability uh factors in place that it is a dead end a lot of adjusters and lawyers are saying listen i don't we don't need like a, a long formal report just tell us what's going on and and we very much do that so i wanted to tell you a little bit about our services we have a fire and explosion investigation group um, we have a canine unit, as mentioned before, that's smoke and SID there. We have structural engineering group, which you, you have uh, met in this past hour, uh, Yaster and Adam. We do electrical engineering investigations. And within the electrical engineering uh, group, we also have an alarm system analysis uh, service. So you could see there Mazen Habash, who's the president of Origin and Cause, who's an electrical engineer, looking at a uh, an alarm system panel and trying to figure out you know, what doors were closed, what doors were open, uh, any motion uh, 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 seen in the motion detectors and so on. So this is an incredible tool, forensic tool that we use frequently when it comes to various types of claims. Uh, we have a mechanical engineering group, which also does a lot of data extraction from heavy equipment and from large trucking, uh, large trucks and even vehicles take, extracting the black box uh, information. We have a materials and metallurgical engineering group. We see Dino Mate there, who's one of our uh, forensic experts looking at a gear clamp. So this usually pertains to uh, the our, our materials and metallurgical team tends to work on uh, a lot of water claims. So this this we work very closely with subrogation units when looking at braided hoses and 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 sprinkler systems, etc. And uh, chemical engineering group as well. So. Um, a lot of times when we get involved in chemical engineering stuff, it, it usually relates to um, a spontaneous combustion types of claims as well as product liability. And forensic litigation services, we're the leading, uh, we're leading the industry in forensic litigation experience. We've been involved in uh, over 1,500 legal cases and qualified as expert witnesses in all levels and types of Canadian courts. We've text, uh, testified as expert witnesses in over 170 litigation proceedings in Canada, the United States, and internationally. I encourage you guys to go to our website. Um, there's a lot of great uh, re resources there. I wanted to also mention, which is something that our clients really love the fact that we have a send new assignment button right here as I'm indicating on the screen. If you click on that, it just asks you for a few things like, you know, your contact information and what's going on uh, in the in the file that that you are handling. And it sends an email directly to myself 
and uh, Mazen Abash, the president of the company, and we cascade it. We make sure that the right expert is assigned to the file and they contact you immediately. So our clients love that, the fact that we're able to respond to them very quickly. Also, you can see here the ask a question button. Um, so clients love to use this when they've got a file. They don't necessarily know if they should be hiring us or not. They go to our website, they hit this ask a question, and they ask us that question. We make sure that we get someone, the appropriate expert, to contact them and have the discussion. And of course, that's free of charge. We also have uh, on our website, we have uh, articles that are posted there on a monthly basis. Um, so we encourage you to take a look at those. They're practical, quick articles, very easy to read that help adjusters and lawyers and brokers with, um, with doing their jobs, doing their jobs faster, more effectively, more thorough. And as I'd mentioned before, the next webinar taking place July 25th, we're really excited about this one. Of course, a lot of people love dogs and, and we're very proud of smoke and, and our, uh, our canine unit. So we're excited to show you guys how we train them and their various personalities and, and how we use them in the field because they are really, really incredible, incredible um, experts as we call them. And that's it. That sums it up. Thank you very much for, for joining us. You'll be receiving a completion certificate in an email uh, soon. If you're part of a group, as I'd mentioned before, send an email to me at webinar at origin-and-cause.com so I can make sure to get a completion certificate for you. And as soon as the webinar ends, there, there's going to be a window that pops up on your screen asking you five feedback questions. We'd love to hear back from you uh, so we can continue to improve future webinars. Uh, thank you again and have a great day, guys.